How are you? I'm Pastor Michael Miano, pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, as well as director of the Power of Preterism Network. And what I want to do this morning is I want to take some time to bring you through some of the details of full preterism and show you how indeed full preterism does have answers. I've been doing this. This is my part three of a series um, I've been doing. I'll explain all that in a moment. Um, we'll get into uh, a host of details I want to share with you today on today's broadcast and hopefully be able to um, give you a comprehensive overview of what full preterism is saying and why full preterism does have answers and those answers are actually sparking a reformation within the body of Christ. First, before I do that, let's pray and then I'm going to tell you about some resources and we're going to jump right into a lot of details this morning. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity to come here onto uh, Google Hangouts, Lord, and uh, make videos on YouTube that display your truth, Lord, that urge the body of Christ toward revival and reformation, Lord, that we will ultimately bring glory to you, worshiping you in spirit and in truth, desiring to make known the manifold wisdom of God. So, Lord, we give you all the glory, praise, and honor, and we just thank you for the spirit that makes known the spiritual things. That way we may be able to make these things known to men. So, Lord, we give you all the glory again, and we just praise you in your mighty and magnificent name. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for uh, tuning in. So, the first thing I want to say is I want to talk about this amazing book I just finished. And again, that's not me just, uh, you know, hyping it up. That's, it was a really good book. That's uh, The Millennium by Joseph Michael Vincent. I may, it might be backwards on the screen. The Millennium Past, Present, or Future, A Biblical Defense for the 40-Year Transition Period by Joseph M. Vincent II. Awesome book. I just finished reading through it. And um, I can honestly say that I agree with the 40 year transition or the trans millennial perspective that the millennium was during that uh, first century um, time of transition. Talking to the author the other day, I want to share with you a uh, message me and him had back and forth. I, I messaged him about the book and then he said to me, there's just too much evidence and far too many indicators that it was not anything beyond the first century, regardless of what someone's view is about it. Now I say that because within preterism, there's a host of different views in regards to the millennium. Again, there are some that would call themselves full preterists, but they would still look forward or believe that we're still completing the millennium, looking toward a future coming of Christ or a future consummation of all things. Um, again, problematic um, to the, the biblical scripture here. Joseph Michael Vincent, he shows where the, the churches went wrong. And one of the key questions that we must ask ourselves as we enter into thinking about the millennium is how does it fit into the, the scheme of scripture, the full story? Um, you know, if Jesus is coming soon, there can't be a literal thousand year block before his coming, because then that, you know, again, try to make that sound soon, that, that just wouldn't work. Um, again, within preterism, there are a variety of different views. Um, one of the ways that I found the best way to explain um, the millennium would be to take the words binding, loosing, judgment, and destroy. Ultimately, we know in Jesus' ministry, he, he bound the strong man. He said that himself. He gave the disciples the opportunity to bind and loose, and he told them whatever they bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever they loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we know that there was a binding of Satan. Jesus bound the strong man during his ministry, and ultimately where we would see the loosing is at the end of around 66 AD, you see that all of a sudden the Jews and Rome, you know, Rome before, if you remember, um, the Apostle Paul was able to appeal to Rome and he was protected from persecution and so forth. However, we know that in you know the late 60s, we know that Rome and Jerusalem went into cahoots and thus surrounded the city of the saints. The Jews would have thought that this would have been persecution upon the Christians and that their day was coming. However, we know ultimately what was revealed through that was the true Jerusalem, the Jerusalem from above, and destruction of the present day Jerusalem, the city that was in bondage, um, you know, the Jews under their old covenant religion. You see a lot of this explained in Galatians chapter four, for example. Now, if Satan was loosed at the end of the, you know, around 66, and then ultimately the coming of the Lord begins at that point, that is judgment, Luke 21, you know, again, you see the same context, Revelation chapter 20, you see that Satan is gonna go out and he's gonna gather around the holy city, the camp of the saints, and um, ultimately, we see this happening in Jerusalem. However, what was going to be revealed was physical Jerusalem was going to come under judgment. The true remnant, spiritual Jerusalem, or the Jerusalem from above, would be revealed in that time, ultimately knowing that the Christians, no Christian died in Jerusalem during the War of the Jews in AD 70. We know that the Christians fled to the mountainous region in Pella, listening to the word of the Lord, and thus were saved. Then you might ask, okay, well, then how was Satan destroyed? And you see, for example, Romans chapter 16 
um, verse 20, it tells us that the Church of Rome, the Apostle Paul writing to the Church of Rome, tells them that they will soon crush Satan under their feet. We know ultimately the last thing to be destroyed was death. And um, that death being the death that was spoken of by Hosea chapter 13, verse 14, as well as Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. Again, not physical death, talking about a covenantal fellowship death that Israel enjoyed with God. Thus, under captivity, they, they were declared dead because of their idolatry and their disobedience to God. Again, a reminder to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And in that, they were judged, declared dead, and thus uh, were waiting for the resurrection of the dead. Again, something very different in their understanding than ours. And we're going to be getting there here in a moment. So I do, I believe uh, Joseph Michael Vincent, again, a great resource, the millennium. Um, definitely check that book out. If I may just share with you a quick quote from the book, a couple of things he has says, no wonder people are apathetic about end times when nothing they believe is supposed to happen actually ever does. And I, I believe that's a very good point. The question of hermeneutics raised by the millennium issue, however, moves beyond the book of revelation. In its most comprehensive scope, of course, it encompasses the proper approach to the Bible as a whole. But more specifically, the millennial debate raises hermeneutical questions concerning Old Testament prophecy, literalism, and the relation of the Old Testament to the New. And that's a quote from Stanley Grant's in the Millennial Maze. So, again, um, awesome resource. Now, what I want to make is the point at the beginning of this video. And I'm going to share my screen here with you in a moment. And I'm, it's going to help uh, illustrate my point. Here we go. All right. So what you're going to see on your screen is a picture of a straw man. Okay. You see this picture. Now I want to explain what this is. Unfortunately, with preterism, you're going to deal with a host of straw man arguments in regards to what preterists are actually saying. A straw man is exactly this. Now, what you would do is if you were a farmer, and you had, you know, a whole garden of crops and you had uh, sheep and, you know, livestock and everything else. Instead of you being the quote unquote shepherd or the, you know, the guard of the, the garden there, you would set up a straw man. This straw man would scare away all those that would come to, you know, steal your crops or to harm your livestock. Now, the key is that the straw man is not the real man. The straw man is the false man set up to represent the real man. Now, now, we must understand that a lot of times what people do is it's easier to, to get rid of the straw man than it is the real man, obviously. So what people do when they begin to talk about preterism is they create this straw man. They don't actually debate the people that are dealing with preterism. Some people do, and I, I admire that. I think that's a great thing. But then even when they're debating the people, though, they're still filling in straw man arguments, not understanding the full complex detail of what preterism is bringing about. For example, let's, let me explain to you what full preterism is, not the straw man that you're viewing on your screen. Straw man, I mean, I'm sorry, preterism essentially is the fact that we believe the last days were fulfilled. We believe those last days are a reiteration of what you see in Deuteronomy chapter 31 through 32. That is the fulfillment of what Moses talked about to Israel. Again, Israel was being built up to be the people of God. You must understand what was happening with Israel in the Old Testament. You must catch the power of the whole biblical narrative and what that is speaking about. God raises up Israel to be his covenant people, tells them that if they listen to him, they will be blessed. If they disobey him, they will be cursed. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Then if you follow from Deuteronomy 30, uh, 28 to 31 and 32, you see that Moses essentially get prophesies to them and tells them what will be their last days, that they will ultimately wander away after idols. They will be judged. They, um, you know, again, there will be a righteous remnant that will be preserved. There will be a resurrection that God was going to do an amazing plan through Israel. I could go on and on again about the fulfillment of that hope. Um, recently in my, sor my um, sermons here at the Blue Point Bible Church, I have been preaching through uh, the New Testament and talking about the hope of Israel fulfilled as the New Testament church. You could go to our Buzzsprout account, simply put in Blue Point Bible Church Buzzsprout in Google, and it should bring you to our podcast and sermons, and you can get all the details you need from there. One of the key things that we must uh, remind ourselves of is that haste makes waste.
So saying haste makes waste, what exactly do we mean by that? Well, unfortunately, I do not believe that the details of your Bible are able to be understood or downloaded into your mind by a flash drive. Again, it takes time. People ask me, you know, how can I become a better evangelist? How can I understand the Bible? How can I explain the Bible? Sometimes people point to me and say, how can I explain the Bible like you do? Uh, again, um, I say the same thing to so many others. Now, the key is going to be that it's going to take time. The church has had this haste makes waste mentality where we must get everybody saved and figure out how to preach the gospel in five minutes. And that has become our detriment because because now we, we start to fill in the blanks of all the details that we don't understand. And now we have a story that is very complexing and confusing. So, again, haste makes waste. We need to backtrack and realize some areas that the historic church has misunderstood and misapplied some of the theological constructs that we have now set up. Again, um, I'm trying to remember the. Who wrote the quote but somebody had made a quote about um about our paradigms that you know do not think that you can you just come into christianity and your mind is formidable and you know you just end up believing everything that jesus taught no we know that what actually happens is we have constructs in our mind that we think you know well this this works like this things that are normal to us things that you know make sense to us so we we see these things we understand these things and then when we're brought up against something that might contradict that that's where the, the challenge comes in. That's where, um, you know, again, I see that happening in the first century. And I believe that's what needs to happen today. People need their um, their constructs to be demolished. If we're going to use 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but that is ultimately the call of Christianity is to demolish those strongholds, the things people's minds have set up to be in opposition to God or in opposition to God's truth and ultimately uh, allow the scriptures to speak to that. Unless, of course, you believe that the church is perfect and has a perfect understanding of theology. I'm not quite sure how that would work in a Protestant worldview, since we also believe that the church had salvation wrong pretty much from the time of Constantine up until the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. Therefore, noting that the church can indeed be wrong at times and the church has times where it needs to take a step back and say, wow, what have we been teaching? Again, that is the doctrine of semper reformanda, ever reforming the nature of the church. So the question is, is how do we do this? How do we destroy the constructs that stand in opposition to the word of God. How do we know when somebody's teaching us falsely um, rather than, you know, obviously you have about five different views even that I could be speaking about today. And how would you know who's right? How do you know I'm right? And that's what I want to do today. I want to, um, I want to kind of answer that. I want to help you navigate these, uh, these uh, kind of complicated roads and this, you know, what we might call a, uh, just a, I, I refer to it as the frosty rivers. Um, you know, again, I think there's a lot of people outside of preterism that try to make biblical preterism very complicated to understand. And uh, I believe here the key is going to be um, to kind of give you an overview of how I believe preterism can be beneficial to your life, how preterism is honoring scriptures, and ultimately how preterism can be best explained and understood. So in this video, not only do I want to continue to respond to some of the more recent critiques of full preterism that I have received and that I have come across and even some that have been leveled at me. The start of this series actually was dedicated to me issuing a proposal to a man named Dr. John Pretlove of First Baptist Church of Lakes in Las Vegas. And I had proposed to him that since he made a video, I mean, I'm a sermon, he preached a sermon about 1 Corinthians 15 and leveled a straw man, as I showed you the picture before, against full preterism, saying that we had a Gnostic view or a Gnostic heresy um, style view of the resurrection of the dead. So I challenged him and I said that he misrepresented full preterism. And if he would be interested, you know, we could do a debate on this topic and, you know, actually allow a full preterist to tell him what full preterists believe. Well, sadly, I didn't receive even a response to my initial proposal. I called the church. I emailed the church. I've you know, done everything I could, made YouTube videos, issued articles, made them public, sent them to people in his congregation, and uh, no response. So again, that just goes to show you what we're up against here when we're dealing with uh, some of these doctrinal matters. Anyone can hide and take pot shots at someone's view without facing them. That's it. Anybody can create a straw man and not actually have anything to really fight. Again, do you picture that straw man chasing the um, wolf? away from the sheep. No, again, the, the straw man's stuck on a, it's fake, it's stuck on a on a pole, so it's kind of hard for the straw man to defend itself. Whereas I'm a real living being that actually does believe in full preterism and has shown myself through YouTube debates, through presentations, through sermons, that I'm able to um, 
debate this and show you the, the truth of what the scriptures are actually saying. So I would say that, you know, what Dr. Pretloff has done is nothing short of dishonor and cowardice. On the other side, I have a gentleman named Carl Albert who recently debated Mr. William Bell, who has been contacting me and making videos in response to my videos here that full preterism has answers. Simply put, he's telling you that I have no answers. I do look to detail some of the areas that I believe he is a bit confused in, in reg these regards. However, the intention of this series is to show how we should be approaching the biblical text and to show that the current reformation that full preterism is having on the church does indeed have answers to our critics. As we enter into this presentation, the first thing I want to do is, again, as I do with all my messages, is to kind of rehearse the gospel in a narrative way. Uh, what's the full force of the story? So you ready? We're going to kind of do a, a rehearsing of the gospel, which I actually, if I may preach to you for a moment, I would say be doing this as much as you can daily when you wake up. Rehearse the faithfulness of God as revealed through the biblical gospel. Now, I'm going I'm to share that with you and then hopefully give you the opportunity to continue to um use that in your own um, spiritual way. So let's start at the beginning of Genesis, right? And, and a key thing in understanding our Bible is to understand audience relevance. Now, audience relevance means what did whatever we're reading mean to the original people that had it? For example, Genesis. We would admit that Genesis has to be quite a few thousand years old. It comes to us most likely from, you know, the ancient Near East. And actually, if you do your research, you'll see that there's ancient Near Eastern literature that matches up with the book of Genesis. They might call that temple text. I know a man named John Walton on YouTube. He does quite a few videos, lectures. He's also a professor, I believe, at Wheaton College. He's bringing out a lot of these details, how what we're seeing in the book of Genesis is God laying a foundation to build his house. You know, and essentially the, the, the core of scripture would be God building his house, and then he was going to come live in it. So when we open up to Genesis, we see this temple text in the ancient Near East. It's important to understand how they would have received these type of writings. These were called origin stories. And what they would be is they would depict the original story of how these people came about. And we see this with Adam and Eve. Adam is taken out from, the, from outside the garden, right, from the world that is um, empty and void or formless and void, which, again, if you study out the context of those Hebrew words, tohu and bohu, you see that. Those words actually mean, um, you know, wasteful and, and, and wandering away, lost, um, you know, without use. Again, if you study the ancients, you know that if something was without use, it was just meant for the trash heap. It was garbage. Again, Jesus says, you know, if the, you're not salty as you're called to be salty, what are you good for? You know, just to be cast out and thrown into the dung heap. So, again, what we're seeing in Genesis is that the ancient Near East, if you study their culture, you know that they were worshiping birds, animals, you know, creatures, everything you could think of without worshiping the one true God. I believe that that was an aberration of man um, not having a full covenant with God, not having a full understanding of God and um, ultimately following his carnal mind to create his own gods. And again, you see this very prevalent in the ancient Near East. Now, what you have in Genesis is something diametrically opposed to what was happening in that time. The true God, the Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever name you like best, reaches out and pulls Adam to himself, pulls man to himself. And he's going to bring man in his presence into this Garden of Eden, into the land, so to speak, as you see through the story of Israel. He's going to bring them into the land. He's going to fashion a woman so that man is not alone, that this whole covenant um, agreement is based on relationships. It's based on in the old covenant, in Adam's covenant, it was going to be based on him multiplying and, you know, people being born into that covenant line of Seth. Now. What we see happening, the seven days and all those details, again, I, admire, I, I exhort you to go and read temple texts. Go and study ancient Near Eastern literature, and you'll see what's happening in the book of Genesis. Is The one true God is declaring his reign, his rule in this world, and his representation of that was not going to be the crocodile, was not going to be the snake, was not going to be the host of other things the ancient people would use to um, glorify their false gods. No, instead, he was going to use man, that man would be his image in the world, that the world would come to know the one true God through his representation, his people. You see how opposed that was to those that in the ancient Near East would fashion things out of wood or to worship animals. And ultimately, that's what you're seeing happen in Genesis. So now God creates man in his image, places man in his, um, in his temple, in his covenant, in his relationship with him. And then gives man law. And the law is that man is allowed to eat of all the trees except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And again, I believe there's a lot in the law of Moses that can bring out the details of that, that you know that in those foreign lands, the trees were food and they were given over to the idols of the land if you lived in a land full of idolatry. So, um, you know, I think of even, for example, in Zechariah, it talks about the oaks of Bashan. And we know that ultimately those oaks would have been the trees that would have been within the Assyrian region in the north that would have 
and been given over to idolatry. And that's why when God tells his people to go into the land that when they plant their crops and everything in the land, they're not allowed to eat of those crops for up to, I believe it was three years, according to the law, because those plants and everything had been given over to idolatry. Again, you know, you see the same argument in the New Testament in regards to um, meat that has been given over to idolatry. Although by the time of the New Testament, now they're revealing that the idols are nothing and the idols are dead. But the whole purpose of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was to keep God's people away from idolatry, to keep them away from the people of the land. So here Adam and Eve are in this garden created with a proper relationship with God. God's moving about them in the cool of the day, which again brings out the temple text of significance. And they don't listen. They, they they follow the carnal mind. They do, you know, what first John speaks of, you know, Eve looks at the, the fruit. She's desirous. She thinks it'll make her wise. She wants to be like God. She therefore listens to the serpent, which again, um, I don't believe in talking snakes. So there's definitely symbolism happening within that story. And essentially she, uh, you know, they fall. She gives the, the apple to Adam. They die. They're declared dead. God told them that in the day they eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, that that day they, sh they shall surely die. And we know that they died that day. Um, Adam lived to be 930 years old, I believe. So we know that he did not die physically that day, but he died in covenant with God. His relationship with God was never the same. This is not, we're not talking about spiritual death here. Spiritual death is when you have the spirit and you die. You see, again, that is, that's something totally different. That's, that's not, not what we're talking about. We're talking about covenant fellowship death happening right here in the Garden of Eden. And now man is given a covering and he, the covering will sustain him in his relationship with God, that he will have a partial relationship with God based on this covering that God has now provided. Now, if you can't see the story of Israel out of that, how Israel was given a covering, the law of Moses, um, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do to tell you how to understand your Bible. Again, Adam and Eve, there's an exodus happening there. There's a world that is formless and void, chaotic, bondage. They are rescued from that, brought into the presence of God. Ultimately, you see the same story with Israel being, being removed from Egypt, being given a law, Exodus chapter 19, and then commanded to follow that law. And ultimately, the story of Adam and Eve is a microcosm of what happens to Israel. We know ultimately Israel suffers that fellowship death. In Hosea, they say, like Adam, you have transgressed the covenant. And it's important to understand a prophetic timeline. If you, you really put the prophets in chronological order, you begin to understand what was happening, that the north was going to go into bondage. So Hosea is prophesying to them. They're the first ones to wander after idolatry. You know that um, when Solomon died, Rehoboam, his son, and um, took control, but he was kind of a hard taskmaster to the people. So a lot of the, the northern tribes wandered after Jeroboam. And he became their king. And then you followed this story throughout the books of Kings and pretty much through the prophets of how God had uh, been dishonored by his people and how they had now been declared dead. Hosea prophesies to the north, tells them they are dead. You see that death mag uh, magnified in Hosea chapter 13. And then in Isaiah chapter 25, Isaiah is prophesying to Judah in the south and telling them ultimately they have become like the north and they will die as well. But the day will come where God will provide a resurrection. He will remove that veil. And again, you see all that context. It's important to understand that was the hope of Israel, that they wandered away from covenant, that they were declared dead like Adam. And they wanted, they longed for the resurrection of the dead. They longed for that restoration. And it, it's important. Take some time. Spend some time in the prophets. If I may, again, recommend my sermon series. I have a lecture I preached about two, three weeks ago um, on the hope of Israel specifically and how you can find that fulfilled. If you understand your Old Testament in chronological order and you follow the narrative of the story and then you jump into the New Testament, and you ultimately understand what Jesus is fulfilling or what the Apostle Paul is declaring. For example, in Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 28, Ephesians 4, 4, the Apostle Paul is very clear that he preaches Nothing other than the one hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead that they had longed for. Now, I urge you, go back in your Bible and find out what's the story of Israel. Now, real quickly, I'm going to explain it to you. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, after God has now given Israel his law, he has set them up as his people. He tells them that they are to be the wisdom and understanding of God. Remember, again, his people are his image in the world. So they are to display the wisdom and understanding of God. In doing that, they are going to lead the nations to the one true God and away from their idolatry. Because the nations will say, wow, look at these people. Their God is with them. Their God is near them. Their God has given them these magnificent statutes to follow. And ultimately, their job was to... Um, affect the nations with the glory of the one true God. So we know that ultimately Israel fails. They wander after the idols. They get in the land. They begin to make covenants with these people. They begin to marry their women. They begin to, you know, um, even set up false altars to false idols and thus are declared dead. So their goal is to one day be reestablished as what they were told in Deuteronomy chapter four or what they were declared in Exodus chapter 19, the glorious people of God, the people that would make known the manifold wisdom of God. That was their hope. They wanted to be those people because ultimately they understood that when you were reigning with God, you were in the land, you were blessed and you prospered. But when you were declared dead by God, 
you suffered curses and it was not life to the full. It was misery. So again, that, that is the context. That is what's happening in the new Testament. We see that that fulfillment is being preached by Jesus and the apostles and ultimately the war of the two Jerusalems, the Jerusalem from above that is spiritual and the Jerusalem that was present in that time. Again, all this is mentioned in Galatians chapter four. Um, go the current day Jerusalem, old covenant was coming under judgment, was passing away, as it said in Hebrews 8, 13. And then the, the new Jerusalem was coming into fruition, the new covenant, the, the children of the free woman, Sarah. So again, if you, if you follow the context of your Bible and you understand that full biblical narrative, then when you get to Revelation chapters 21 and 22, and it talks about a new heaven and a new earth, you say, oh, well, the old heaven and old earth was formless and void. And you remember in Genesis one and then how it followed through. And then God declared his people as, as the heaven and earth in Deuteronomy chapter 32 as well. Moses calls them heaven and earth and they are God's heaven and earth. If you understand that whole temple system and how the people were the heaven and earth, the temple was the heaven and earth and the covenant would have been declared heaven and earth. And the story is that God was refilling, renewing his people to restore them into his presence and to give them life and life to the full instead of the death that they suffered ultimately by violation of the law. And then the sin. And, you know, again, Don Preston does a really good job at detailing a lot of those details. So it's important that you understand that. Now, what I want to do is I want to kind of go through some of those details. I just unpacked the gospel for you. I hope you catch the power of that. But now what I want to do is I want to kind of go back and I want to go over some of the details and um, possibly make some sense out of some of the things. So first, let's talk about Adam and Eve. I'm going to turn to Genesis chapter 3. And I'm going to read a little bit here, and we're going to, we're going to find out what some of these details are. All right, so we're going to start here at verse 9. Actually, I'm sorry. Verse eight. Then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called out to man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate off. Always what we do. Always blame somebody else. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and her, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and pain you will bring forth children. Yet you desire... Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree from which I have commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you and toil. You will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall grow for you and you will eat the plant of the field by the sweat of your face. You will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now he has stretched out his hand and he will take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove man out at the east of the garden of Eden. He stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. So now... Adam and Eve eat this tree. They're declared dead by God. Obviously, they're still alive, but they're dead to God. And then they're, all these curses are put upon them. The serpent is cursed. He's going to be cursed above all the livestock. He's going to dwell on his belly. I've never seen a walking snake. Clearly, something needs to be understood here in the audience relevance. He will eat the dust, and uh, he will do this all the days of his life. There will be um, hatred between him, his seed, and the woman's seed. Again, I, I don't believe this is talking about serpents. It's just kind of strange. Jesus in John 8 tells the Jews that they were the sons of the devil. They are the, the children here, the, the seed. Again, you're going to see the seed of a woman, Jesus, and you're going to see the seed of the devil, the Jews in the first century. John chapter 8, he tells them that specifically. Um, also, he, he rebukes them another time. He says, you make them twice, you make your disciples twice as much the sons of hell as you are. Again, understanding the context there. And um, this, this serpent is going to be bruised on the head, going to be crushed by by this the seed of this woman and he will bruise the heel of this uh 
woman's child. And then to the woman, he will greatly multiply the pain in childbirth. I know many people say that's why women experience pain today. Um, they will bring forth children in pain, yet your desire will be for your husband. Have you ever seen childbirth? I've never seen it in person. I've seen it on TV and uh, I'm trying to understand how that would be done without pain. <laughs> you know, again, it, it doesn't sound like something that would be done without pain. Um, again, it's like a pretty big head coming out of a small space. It's a human body. It just sounds like it's going to be pain. I don't think that Eve, when if she was having children before that, that she was, you know, it was, um, it was not painful. Again, it just seems kind of mind blowing here. And then to Adam, oh, and also evil desire to be over her husband. And then to Adam, he's cursed. He's going to work for his food. He's going to have to stew it in the sweat. It's going to be thorns and thistles are going to grow. And uh, it's, it's going to be tough. You know, he's going to have to till the ground. And then he was taken from dust. He will return to dust. And Eve is declared the mother of all living. God gives them a covering. And then they are barred from the tree of life that will allow them to live eternally. Well, this kind of sounds like a veiled covenant to me. I have to say, um, the serpent, again, eating dust. Let's talk about biblical dust here for a moment. First off, let's just declare that Adam was dead that day, right? That God said in, let's see, let's find the verse. Okay, here we go. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you will surely die. Okay, verse 17, 217. So in that day, when Adam ate of the tree, when Eve handed him the apple or the, the fruit or whatever you think it was, um, he died that day. Death was declared that day. And... Thus, that we know again, it's not physical death. So now let's talk about the dust. Adam was was taken from the dust. He was formed of the dust. Now many people would posit that this means physical, uh, you know, that he he was literally materially created from the dust. I read a rather encouraging quote from John Walton on that yesterday. I'll share with you here. Let me just find it real quickly. And uh, again, I, I find it very problematic that Adam was formed out of dust, and then Eve wasn't. Remember, Eve was formed from uh, Adam again. Is this the way that we're uh, putting together material creation today? It just sounds kind of archaic. I guess that would be the, the proper way of explaining. I'm finding that quote here to share with you. And uh, well, we'll get into a little bit here about biblical dust. What I'm going to do is as I'm waiting to find the quote, I want to bring you to a uh, website we're going to go through here to under, better understand the curse. As a matter of fact, the first thing I want to do is talk about Adam being a covenant man. So what we're going to do is we're going to go here. And we're going to flip over. All right. So I'm hoping that on your screen, you're able to see this covenant man summary. Now, what you'll see is that this is how we're going to understand Adam as the first covenant man, not Adam as the first man but Adam as the first covenant man before I do that I just want to share that quote the dust is an archetypal feature and therefore cannot be viewed as a material ingredient is it it is indicative of human destiny and mortality and therefore is a functional comment not a material one therefore Adam was taken from mortality he was taken from a world of pagan idolatry that was not immortal that was you know living very mortal and he was brought into immortality into relationship with God and taken from the dust, again, taken from outside of covenant, brought into covenant, and thus violated covenant and was sent back out of covenant, not to eat of the tree of life, therefore not having life eternal, not having immortality, returning to the dust. You see, that was the thing. It's kind of like if I take in um, a gangbanger, again, I'm a former gangbanger, so I'm going to use this analogy here. If I take in a gangbanger to my home that is stuck in the streets and he comes into my home and he proceeds to rob me and, and steal from me and abuse me, I would tell him, you must leave my house. You do not get to enjoy the benefits of being in relationship with me. You, from a gang member you came into a gang member, you will return. That is exactly what's happening in that Garden of Eden story. You see here in this chart, Adam, before placed in the garden, he there was no law. He was innocent. He had no knowledge of law. He was not righteous because there were sins without law. Again, you see this in the book of Romans. He was naked. He was mortal. He was earthy. He was a living soul. Again, um, it's important to understand the word soul. I see so many people create very erroneous misunderstandings of the word soul. Soul is nefesh 
in Hebrew. And nefesh is a word that's used for animals. Animals are living souls. Humans are living souls. Your entire being is called a soul in the Hebraic perspective. So do not be uh, guilty of going into this um, Hellenistic thinking that the soul is another part of the body that is immortal. And, you know, again, that's where people get off into a lot of these odd doctrines. Now, he's a living soul, a suke, right? Then Adam is given covenant. He is brought into covenant with God. And he is declared, he obviously falls and he's declared guilty. Now he has knowledge of law. Now he's guilty. He's not righteous. He's sinned. It's different than when he had, you know, he he was outside of law and he sinned. Now that he's been brought into covenant, given law and he sinned, it's a willful sin. Now he's condemned. Before he wasn't condemned. Now he's condemned by law. Now he must clothe himself. We will see this with the Israel. They, they begin this doctrine of works, old covenant. You'll be judged by what you do. Um, his mortality is magnified. As we know, the law was intended to increase sin, to magnify the effects of sin. His earthy um, the earthness, you know, his being of the earth was magnified and his natural state, his sukikan, was magnified as well. Then we see the same thing happening here with Gentiles. Gentiles, for example, would be Adam prior to being placed in the garden, a non-covenant man. They were innocent and guilty. You know, they, they knew the law. They didn't know the law. The Apostle Paul says that the Gentiles who have not the law follow the law. They were not righteous because sin is within all. They were both condemned and not condemned. They were not condemned by law, but they were condemned by their idolatry and in their works. They had various different, you know, um, views. Again, you see a lot of this being spoken about through the Apostle Paul in his epistles when he's talking about the, the flesh, the flesh of the, the lust of the flesh. Again, Gentiles had lust of their flesh, their own righteousness, their own deeds, their own religion, their own ways of thinking. And then you had the, the Jewish way of thinking. That's something that you have to deal with in the New Testament. Gentiles were mortal. They were of the sea. They were natural. Covenant man after resurrection under grace is not declared guilty because we know of Christ now. We have righteousness through Christ. And we're declared righteous though we sin. We're not condemned. We're clothed in Christ. We're immortal, heavenly, and spiritual. You see that the natural and the spiritual are the two comparisons. We're going to get there here in a moment. So now that I've explained to you Adam as a covenant man. Again, this would have been the context. You could find this at Death is Defeated. Gerald Crad has an amazing presentation on Adam as the first covenant man. If you're looking on the screen, you can see that there. Now, another thing I want to take to you to is this article here by um, James Kessler. And I believe that this article actually is uh, very interesting. So I'm going to share this. This will explain some of the dust and the curses that we find in Genesis and how that brings us into a covenant understanding if we actually do indeed take the audience relevance perspective. What exactly is the nature of the curse we are introduced to in Genesis account and how do we reconcile it with the preterist perspective of past fulfillment? That answer isn't as difficult as one might think. Some of the conversation here of late has focused on Eve being the mother of all living, but it should be addressed in the context of the curse as well, because she is named right after the curse that God has now issued in the previous several passages beginning in Genesis 3.16. The curse imputed in Genesis 3 is the precursor to the Hebrew writer addressing the significance of Eve being the mother of all living. Again, those that were clothed in covenant with God were declared alive. Israel, under law, was declared alive because they had a partial covenant with God, whereas the Gentiles were dead to God in the world without hope, as revealed in the book of Ephesians. This is an important point because Isaiah 65 deconstructs the same curse that was given in Genesis 3 and how it relates to the covenant line that Jesus Christ that gave us Jesus Christ and began with Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, 16 through 17, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then he said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, have eaten from the tree, which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And he tells him in the sweat of your face, you shall eat, you shall till the ground. For you, from it you were taken, for dust you are, to dust you shall return. That was the curse that God pronounced. And this is God's decree that he begins the history of Adam's descendants till the time Titus unleashes his legions upon Jerusalem and the end of the power of the holy people, as we read about in Daniel chapter 12. Then he will greatly multiply their sorrow and conception. In pain, they will bring forth children. It is the language of a nation that through suffering would one day be fully redeemed. Again, look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river. When he held up his right hand and his left hand, he swore by him who lives forever for times, time and a half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be fulfilled. Again, it's important to understand that when people were born into this 
covenant, into this covenant of Adam and Eve, because Eve became the mother of all living. They were born under a law of sin and death. They were born under the law of bondage that the Apostle Paul talks about throughout his epistles. So it's important to understand that, that when it's saying that they will not bear children in child on the children in pain. Again, if you read Isaiah chapter 65, uses the same correlation. In the new covenant, children aren't born into covenant. Children are reborn. Again, John chapter three, that spiritual new birth. And they're not born into a covenant of death. They are born into a covenant of life. So right there, we see one of those curses already overturned by the new covenant. In the new covenant, we are in the land of the Lord. We, Jesus is our rest as declared, declared by Hebrews chapter three through four. Therefore, the curse that Adam would have to till the land and work and would suffer as Isaiah 65 shows that the captivity would not be able to eat of their own fruit because when they were in captivity, that was something they suffered. That was the curse. Now, in the new covenant, we know that we cannot be removed from our covenant, that God doesn't send comings of the Lord to scatter us as a scattered people. That instead, as Isaiah 65, verse 25 says, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat like the ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy all in my holy mountain. The people of the Lord today are dwelling in um, insecurity. The sin of the garden was disobedience, which caused separation from God in the eternal sense. The power of the cross was Christ's total obedience to the Father's will and our reconciliation with God. This is the whole theme of the covenant. Eve was the mother of all those under the curse and was given her name in accordance with that designation. She was also the same mother of the ones who were redeemed upon the arrival of the new heavens and new earth that we read and rejoice over in Isaiah's account of the restoration of all things. And again, that amazing article. Those are the things we must understand these details in their proper context. That's the only way we're going to make sense of our Bible is if we begin to understand these details in their proper audience relevance and proper context. Again, I might just re recommend some resources by John Walton and Google him on YouTube. He has a great book, The Lost World of Genesis 1. And uh, I also have a host of, um, again, if you go to the Buzzsprout account, you'll find a host of my sermons detailing the um, detailing the beginning of the ancient Near East and Genesis. Just go to Buzzsprout, Blue Point Bible Church. Go back to our uh, beginning of our first love, returning to our first love Bible series. I went through the book of Genesis and I showed you the context and the details that are happening there. I noticed another thing in Paul Albert's video is that it seems the brothers failing to misunderstand how these terms rely were um, understood by the original audience. For example, we just talked about dust. Another one would be shining like the brightness of the firmament. Again, we see that in Daniel chapter 12, that after the resurrection, that the saints are going to shine like the brightness of the firmament. They're going to shine like the stars in the sky. And we see Jesus say this actually in Matthew chapter five, I believe it is. I'm going to see if I can find it on my computer real quickly. Um, I don't remember the verse. I always, I always think of it in my head. I always write it on my notes, but then I always forget. I'm sorry. It's Matthew chapter 13, verse 43. It says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. I love that phrase. Whoever has ears, let him hear, because usually that's the key of spiritual speaking, that Jesus is telling them that in your carnal mind, you're not going to understand these things, but whoever has ears to hear, eyes to see. Again, he knew they had ears and eyes, but he's telling them, let's see if you have the um, proper mentality to understand the significance of these things. So really when we're opening up our Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we must understand covenant. We must understand what God's agenda was in all of this. What's God longing to do? He's longing to dwell with his people and for his people to be his image in the world. Sorry about that. We got a little background noise. I'm just going to close that out for us. So again, that is important for us to understand. Now, how does all of this relate to the story of the Old Testament? What is the story of Scripture? Again, you know, we have to begin to understand what the story of Israel was. The story of Israel was that they were declared dead by violating covenant. Again, we see this in the book of Hosea, as I mentioned. We see this in Isaiah. We see this pretty much as the whole story. And, and when you understand the death that Israel was suffering and their longing for resurrection, then you can begin to understand, oh, that's what the resurrection was about. It was restoring them to their new covenant hope what they couldn't have under the old covenant. Now, one of the things Carl Albert mentions in his video is that I don't understand Israel. I don't, I don't um, have a, a good understanding of Israel. It tells me that Daniel chapter 12 is not speaking about Israel. I have to say, Mr. William Bell did a great job when he jumped on that uh, video, the part two in response to me. Um, Mr. William Bell did a great job of detailing 1 Corinthians 15's proper context, as well as the context of Daniel's chapter seven, nine, as well as 12. But here, let's just turn there real quickly and let's see what kind of details we could draw out of that book. Now, remember again, he said that this is not about Israel. That's what 
um, Carl Albert's words were that Daniel chapter 12 is not speaking about Israel, which is odd because, you know, the, the prophets all prophesied. These are Israel's prophets. Again, if we understand the narrative, then we can better understand our Bible. You must understand the whole story before you begin to pick out the details. Now, at the end of time, right again, who's, who's Daniel talking to? Uh, let's, you know, I mean, we could go back in the book. He's, he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. He's talking to the Jews. He's writing this writing down for the Jewish people. Again, the Gentiles wouldn't have been the ones reading his prophecy. So clearly he's talking about Israel. Now at the time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, who are his people? Exodus chapter 19, go back and read Israel, that there is treasured possession. Michael stands guard of his, over his people. Again, another uh, discussion, angels and everything else. They will rise over his people. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Josephus recognized that as the war of the Jews and you know most Christian writers have recognized that as the war of the Jews. And at that time, when your people, everyone who is found written in the book of life will be rescued. Again, the Jews were the only ones written in these catalogs, the book of life that Moses talks about in his writings. I have a blog on the heavenly scroll, the book of life, and what all that has to do with. Again, you could look up a Miano Gone Wild and just put in book of life in Google and you'll find us some great resources. Many of those who sleep in the dust, again, went over to mortality. When you died under the old covenant, you didn't go into the full glory of God. You died and awaited the time of the resurrection of the dead. So you went back to mortality. Many of those who sleep in the dust in mortality of the ground will awake these to everlasting life others to disgrace and everlasting contempt when that judgment came that jesus said in matthew chapter 16 some of those people in front of him would be alive for then they would receive their reward and be judged this is what daniel 12 is talking about many of those who were in their immortality were in mortality those that were under the old covenant would raise this is their resurrection they were longing for a time that they would be restored in the presence of god ultimately we know in ad 70 when that temple was destroyed that that was judgment upon that old covenant system that we trust that the details of first corinthians 15 the dead ones you know israel was afraid well if our forefathers had wandered in the faith and they had you know sought to glorify god under the old covenant what about them did they just die without any reward and now they're cut off and you know the gentiles would have loved that and boasted and that said yeah you guys were under a system of death there's no hope for you there's no resurrection of the dead it's whoever believes in jesus christ in this time and that's why we ultimately see in the gentile churches there was a lot of persecution again read second thessalonians chapter one the gentiles were being severely persecuted and their concern was well, what about those of us that are dying? You know, we're coming into this knowledge of Christ. We're now being welcomed into covenant with the, the one true God, the God of Israel. And our people are dying. We're being slaughtered by not only our own countrymen, but also the Jews. So there was a lot of trauma there. And they're being told that, no, the, you know, if they don't stay alive till the coming of the Lord, then there's no hope for them. And that's what the Apostle Paul is detailing in First Corinthians, First Thessalonians 4, saying those that dead in Christ will rise. Those that died in Christ will rise. They will precede you, actually. And then you will be transformed. Again, the, the, Greek, the Greek word there for transformed actually means transition of covenant. Um, I'm working on something about that. Amazing details. Then the, the First Corinthians 15 is actually speaking to the dead ones of Israel, the Necroi. And they're going to be raised also prior to, you know, again, Hebrews chapter 11 explains that, that they could not receive their reward apart from the, the living saints in that end time, in that consummation of the ages that the Apostle Paul calls it. Or in the book of Hebrews, it says that he was crucified and he was, you know, put to death at the consummation of the ages. So those saints in the consummation of the ages needed to be glorified. And with them were the old covenant saints as well as the dead that were dying and being persecuted for Jesus. So when you begin to understand all those details, the, the gospel becomes beautiful and it becomes what the Bible is actually intending for it to say. So here in Daniel 12, that's exactly what's being talked about. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse. Again, I quoted this from Matthew chapter 13. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It's going to be hard to lead everybody to righteousness if everything's perfect. You can't be leading anybody. So again, you see the need for a world that needs healing. Again, go back to Revelation chapter 22, and it tells you that now we have access to the tree of life, the healing of the nations, Jesus. Now we have access to the gospel. That's the context of the resurrection. The resurrection would restore you into the covenant, the communion that Israel longed for and be able to lead the nations to righteousness, which Israel was supposed to do. Again, go back to Deuteronomy chapter four. They were called to be the people of God that were going to exhort the nations around them to come to the one true God. Israel did not walk worthy. They were dead to God and thus the resurrection would restore them. And that's why the New Testament church in and through the righteousness of Jesus Christ fulfills the longings and hope of Israel, the manifestation of the sons of God spoken about in Romans chapter eight. So 
But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, seal them up for the end of time. Many will go back and forth. Knowledge will increase. And I, Daniel, looked. Behold, two were standing on the banks of the river, one on the other bank of the river. And one man said to the man, how long will it be till these wonders occur? I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters, the river. He raised his right hand, his left toward heaven, swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and a half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard, I said, my Lord, what will be the outcomes of these events? Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. Many will be purged, purified, refined, but the wicked will act wickedly and none of those wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. Again, that is why I'm a full preterist. I do understand. You know, again, that, that's the context. It was those that would see Christ as the righteousness and not depend on on their righteousness of their law, not depend on the righteousness that they were never under law, the lust of the flesh, and they would come into the unity of the faith and ultimately glorify God and be those people that were purged, purified, and given over to the righteousness of Jesus. So again, that shows you the problem. One of the things Romans chapter 14 verse 9 says is that the reason for Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection was that he would become the God of the living and the dead. That's the goal here. That God would become the living, the God of the living and the dead. Now, God is sovereign. God has been the God of the living and the dead physically from the beginning of creation. So what is that saying? It's saying that God would become the God of the living, meaning those that were living in relationship with him, as well as those that were the dead, that they would be restored into relationship with God. And ultimately, again, that is the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I, I believe that, uh, again, I mentioned that Mr. William Bell did a great job of showing. I loved one of the details he brought up was that the end of sin was the end of death. Again, sin brought forth death. And therefore, if there's an end of sin, there's going to be an end of the death that sin is bringing. And that's what we're talking about in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 15, the entirety of the New Testament. And one of the things I have to mention that um, William Bell really did bring out very well was in 1 Corinthians 15, the two bodies being compared, you know, with, with what kind of body will they come, which we're going to get into here in a moment. But one of the things that stands out is um, the physical, natural, spiritual. Now, a lot of people, they, they keep pitting, you know, and Carl Albert is guilty of this, pitting spiritual and physical against each other. See, that's not the Hebraic mind. That, that's actually Gnosticism. Gnosticism puts spiritual and physical on two different um, categories. The, the Hebrew mind was that the spiritual was being revealed through the physical. So was physical, biological, natural, old covenant, flesh and blood Israel worshiping God the way they were supposed to? No, they weren't manifesting the spiritual the way they were supposed to. They were not eating the commands of God as per Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. Thus, they were declared dead. Now, how would they be declared alive? The Messiah was going to bring that righteousness and bring them to life. It would be by his righteousness. It would be through the spirit that it would not be dependent upon the natural covenant that, you know, we are the children of Abraham by flesh and blood. No, it would not be that the Gentile was not in covenant by flesh and blood. And now they're being welcomed in due to their flesh and blood. No, it was going to be completely based upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are going to worship God in spirit and in truth rather than the flesh and blood, because we know that no flesh and blood will inherit the kingdom of God. So. When we understand those two phrases that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, going all the way back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you understand the words natural and spiritual are not talking about physical and spiritual. They're talking about natural. Again, there was a natural old covenant. It was based on being born into the flesh and blood lineage of Abraham. That lineage was what was coming to an end in the first century. That's why John the Baptist tells them, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Do not think that you can call yourselves children of Abraham, for God can raise up children of Abraham out of these stones. What was he saying? What's the significance of that message? Why, when you read through the New Testament, do you keep reading about the transition of the children of Abraham? That's the key. The key to understand your Bible is to understand what God was doing. What was the hope of Israel? They wanted to display the glories of God. They couldn't do it through their natural covenant. They couldn't do it by natural means. They needed a spiritual covenant dependent upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what's being told in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, all the way up to the details of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Alan Bondar, pastor of Lift Church in Fort Myers, Florida, actually preached an amazing sermon series on 1 Corinthians, and he called it Transition, and he detailed all the different transitions happening within the book of 1 Corinthians. And most of it's moving from natural to physical, I mean to spiritual. Again, you see one of the beginning arguments that always stands out is the argument between do you cling to Apollos or do you cling to Paul? 
You know, are you of the Greeks or are you, are you of the Jews? And ultimately, that was the problem in the first century, that they, it was supposed to be the unity of the faith, Jew and Gentile in one body. We're going to get there in a moment. But there, there was a lot of, you know, details, a lot of lust of the flesh. The Gentiles had their issues. They felt they were superior to the Jews. The Jews felt they were superior to the Gentiles. And coming into a unity of the faith, not only saving the um the, the 12 tribes of Jacob, but also bringing in the Gentiles, bringing a light to the Gentiles was a very hard thing. Again, that's fulfillment of uh, Isaiah chapter 49, verse six. So again, we have to understand these things, you know, and, and, and you have to begin to understand what the hope of Israel was. And if you kind of just get that in your mind, you begin to understand the rest of your Bible and just read these writings as letters or as the genre of literature that they were intended to be. Unfortunately, most people understand the coming of the Lord. We're, we're sitting here trying to talk about the resurrection of the dead. Meanwhile, we have people still waiting for a five foot six Jewish man to float out of the sky. And somehow we've called that the return of Jesus or the coming of the Lord. Today, I'm actually going to be sending out an email to my church in regards to the comings of the Lord. This past Sunday, we did a thing at our church um, based on based on a clarity. And I, I want to offer the church clarity. And we. Um, we talked to, I asked everybody, you know, what's, what are some areas that they didn't feel they, they fully understood? And one of the areas was the coming of the Lord. So what we did was we backtracked and we went over quite a few different comings of the Lord happening in the Bible. And um, ultimately I had brought us back to Isaiah chapter 19, um, the coming of the Lord into Egypt, Isaiah chapter 34, the coming of the Lord into Edom. And then we moved over to the new testament matthew chapter 16 where jesus says the coming of the lord is going to occur while some of them are alive then we went to matthew chapter 24 where jesus gave the signs of the coming of the lord and what would happen and um, ultimately how he said it would happen in that generation matthew chapter 24 verse 34 went over to luke chapter 21 so the context to a gentile audience of what the coming of the lord would look like how the um the, the armies would gather around the city of jerusalem before they came in and completely destroyed the temple and the city so it's important to understand what a coming of the Lord was to the Hebraic people. And one of the links I'm going to be giving out is right here. I'm going to share the screen with you. You see Old Testament cloud comings. And, and on this website, actually, you get a pretty good um, detailing of you know the different comings going all the way back to genesis when the lord came down to see the tower of babel you know what do we believe that was a literal coming in deuteronomy 33 when um the lord came to sinai it says he came down with ten thousand saints again we don't read anything about moses seeing ten thousand people coming with jesus um you know many of the times that god came down to bring judgment upon nations he shook mountains we don't read those things and again you can just read the host of comings of the lord and the cloud imagery used throughout your bible and to better understand this this um, coming of the Lord as depicted through the through the Bible, not not what man has wanted to make it out to be. Also, livingthequestions.org has a great resource on the comings of the Lord throughout the Bible. The second thing that we must come to understand is the resurrection of the dead. Just like you're going through your Bible looking up the comings of the Lord, the, the goal, again, I would just simply refer to my uh, sermon series that I, I have on this where I, I actually distributed a lecture recently on the hope of Israel. And I believe I very clearly depicted what the law and the prophets shown as the, the hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead, and how that is so opposed to the, the odd version of the resurrection that is pitched by most people today. So again, all of this stuff is just based on a very problematic understanding of preterism as well as the scriptures. So another thing I wanna do real quickly as we're talking about the resurrection, we're talking about the hope of Israel being fulfilled, we're talking about the glories of God, is I wanna to put to death this Israel only doctrine. Again, there's quite a few people out there that, um, again, preterism is very divided. Let's, let's be clear on that. So once you understand that preterism is divided and it's led by mere men, again, we're all men here and women, men and women, um, but we're let all carnal people, we're, you know, we're, we're all human. So we, we all have our flaws, we have our misunderstandings, we have our slights, we have, you know, all those details. So. Within preterism, it's only fair that we're going to have people that are going to divide the movement, that are going to have prideful things, that are going to want to make it about them, you know, and all the details. So the Israel only doctrine is saying that the Gentiles that the new the Old Testament speaks of are actually the scattered north, you know, the Ephraim and, and all those that had wandered off and went over to worshiping the Baals and the Oaks of Bashan and so forth. And um Yes, that, that, those are, that's what uh, Israel only would say. Those are the only Gentiles. The problem I have with this is that if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4, the whole purpose of Israel being called out of Egypt and being set up with the law of Moses was to affect the nations around them. Again, this is before the division of Israel. 
This is when Israel is a unified people and they're going to affect the nations around them and bring them to praise the one true God. Ultimately, we know Israel fails, and this is what leads to their hope for restoration, that they long to be restored, and then God promises them that in their restoration, again, Isaiah 49, 6, in your restoration, it will not be enough that my servant will call out and gather my people from the 12 tribes of Israel, but he will also be a light to the Gentiles. Again, if you understand that, you understand the problem of Israel was that they were not able to display the glory of God. That's what the whole hope of Israel was, that they would be reigning with God and they would display his glories and appreciate the blessings. They failed. So then we know that they failed because they were dependent upon flesh and blood. Ultimately, what we're going to see happen is they're going to be redeclared the witnesses. Isaiah 43 very clearly and beautifully displays what was happening in the transition of the covenant. Israel failed to be the witnesses. So now what's going to happen is Jesus come. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to resurrect them and establish them as his witnesses. We see this in Acts chapter one, verse eight, for example, where he gives them the spirit and the spirit is giving them the power to bring the gospel to what well, he promises them the spirit and it's going to give them the power to preach the gospel to the ends of the world again that which israel failed to do the hope of israel was to be restored in exactly that and we know that the way that we could do that today is because christ is now dwelling in his people that it's not a matter of flesh and blood but it's about coming and putting off the lust of the flesh putting off jew gentile and coming into the unity of the body of christ so again and then you see this in Revelation chapter 22, that all of this is about bringing people into this unity. If you were to read the entire Old Testament, it's about Israel failing to bring people to the unity of faith, failing to bring people into covenant with God, and ultimately how Christ is now enabling the church to be that, exactly what Israel was longing to be. The church is now those sons of God that are bringing people to the one true God. Again, that is your, your doctrine. So now the Israel only um, you know doctrine misses the point because they're saying that Israel was only about itself. Well, then. Why did God give them the law? What was the purpose? What was Deuteronomy 4 saying? Again, the whole thing is just nonsense. It's nonsense. It's men trying to make doctrines about themselves, and it just doesn't work that way. Study the context of what the hope of Israel was and why they longed for this, and what is your Bible detailing? What was the story of Adam and Eve? What were they doing? Is this just some fancy mythological tales, or is what God's doing is setting up his image in this world through Adam and Eve? Again, ancient Near Eastern text. Go study it for yourself. You'll see how beautiful it is. So... Now we've explained that. I want to, another thing I wanted to detail on this broadcast is IBV, IBD, EBV, CBV. No, I'm not doing the alphabet here. IBV, individual body view. IBD, immortal body at death. EBV, essential body view. CBV, corporate body view. Now, I'm going to explain those to you. In preterism, is a host of different theories of what the resurrection of the dead is. The individual body view is that every saint has an individual body, that you will be resurrected into a glorified body. I urge you to find that as the hope of the prophets. That wasn't the hope. The hope of the prophets was not that they would be given immortal bodies to dwell in a heavenly realm. Again, the hope of Israel was that they would be the people who would make known the manifold wisdom of God, that they would stand as the wisdom and understanding of God. So immortal body view, Keep asking Ed Stevens for more substance. All that I keep seeing from these camps is just knocking the corporate body view, which I could actually make a very good defense for. Immortal body at death is pretty much the, the IBV view, is that if it's immortal body view, when you receive that immortal body view is at death. That's an immortal body. You know, your individual body is an immortal body that you view at death. Again, you can listen to Brian Schwartley kind of make fun of and mock this perspective in his uh, rebukes of the full preterist view of resurrection. I don't hold to that. That is not my doctrine. I don't believe there's a body waiting for me in heaven that one day I'm going to receive. Essential body view, um, a complete nightmare. Um, just I brought that up because I just want to show you that people are making up all kinds of things. And, you know, again, it, it has a lot to do with even the futurist view of, you know, the, the new body that you're going to be given. Again, that is not what Scripture is speaking about. The new body that was going to be given was that the Jews in their old covenant body did not make known the manifold wisdom of God. The Gentiles in their old covenant body, if you read the book of Ephesians, were in the world without hope, without God. Right. The Gentiles began to feel superior. The Jews felt superior. And you had all these problems compounding. The resurrection was going to be done through one glorious body, the body of Jesus Christ, making those bodies dead, bringing people into the body of Christ. That is the corporate body view that the hope of Israel would be consummated not by you receiving a new body, not by you dying and getting a new body, but by Jesus Christ dying, raising and in his glorified body, we shall all be united and be able to do exactly what Israel longed for. Enjoy the blessings of reigning with God and making known the manifold wisdom of God. Again, this is all made known through the epistles, through the New Testament. This is the, the end to which the apostle Paul is working. He's trying to unify the saints. That is why 
He gives you all this doctrine and all his epistles, and then he gives you practical ways of living it out. Because the whole goal is that the doctrine would unite the people, that people would begin to worship God in spirit and in truth. Israel was supposed to be calling people to that. They failed. The church now is set up as the wisdom and understanding of God calling people to that right faith. So it's again, it's so important to enter into these details. Um, you know, one of the things that um, Carl Albert keeps bringing up is some will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body, soma or somata, again, it could be uh, the plural is somata, um, what kind of body will they come? Now, this is where it gets a bit tricky, and you must understand the context of 1 Corinthians 15. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, and he's telling them about all these dissensions that they have. They're, they're so natural-minded. They're missing the spiritual things of God. They're focusing on, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm a Gentile, I'm a Jew, and you're missing out on the unity of the faith, on everything that God is doing in and through you, you church at Corinth. Right. So then he begins to talk about bodies and how they need to you know the well, he essentially deals with a lot of the problems that they're dealing with in their church. Then he deals with the, uh, the, the gifts, how everybody's a member of this one body. He tells you, go all the way back to First Corinthians 12, He's talking about one body, talking about the body of Christ. And as you're coming into the body of Christ, many of you have gifts. Some of you Gentiles come with these gifts. Some of you Jews come with these gifts. Some of you speak different languages. Let all things be done for the edification of the body. First Corinthians 13 goes on this long thing about how all things are done for love. And what is love? Again, they need to love re-explained. First Corinthians 14 talks about how they are to use these gifts and for the edification of the body. First Corinthians 15 now is saying, well, okay, so now there's some among you who are saying there's no resurrection of the dead. Again, you must understand resurrection of the dead as a promise to Israel. It was the hope of the Pharisees. Acts chapter 24, the Apostle Paul makes this very clear. So what Israel was longing for was a resurrection, to be reestablished, to be reinvited into proper communion with God. Now, you would imagine in that time where they're all coming into this unity of the faith, Jew, Gentile, in and through Jesus, now the Gentiles begin to say there's no resurrection of the dead. Even some of the Jews, you know, the Sadducees, they all had this mentality that there was no resurrection of the dead. There was going to be no restoration. And the Apostle Paul begins to say that you have to admire the way that he starts at 1 Corinthians 15. He says, no, according to the scriptures, he brings them back to Hosea chapter 6. He brings them to Hosea chapter 13. He brings them to Isaiah chapter 25. He brings you to Isaiah chapter 53. He, he reminds you of all these Old Testament prophecies and what they had to say and how if the Old Testament, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then this whole thing is nothing because this whole thing is dependent upon the promises to the old covenant people. So if God is not fulfilling his promises to old covenant people, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then everybody's faith is futile. Jesus wasn't even raised from the dead then because his resurrection from the dead was based upon the promises to the old covenant promise, uh, prophets. You see, that's what's happening in 1 Corinthians 15. It's not There weren't people wandering around. Again, they believed in the resurrection of Jesus. It's a letter written to the churches. They believed Jesus had been raised from the dead physically in the flesh. They believed in that. They had that understood. They understood that was according to scripture. They understood that Christ raising from the dead was signifying a true spiritual reality that the dead ones were also being raised, that this covenant was now coming to an end and the glorious new realities of the Messiah was coming into fruition. That's the hope of Israel. That's the hope of Israel fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ. That is the resurrection of the dead. So again, that's why it says flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom because Israel was the seed that was planted. They were the old covenant seed that needed to die. Again, I, I've always found it interesting that if we're talking about physical bodies in 1 Corinthians 15, do you bury somebody and then they die? Again, 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear that you put the seed in the ground and then it dies. The whole point was God made Israel, you know, started Adam being that beginning seed. God started this seed, placed it in the ground. It died. And then he was going to provide the resurrection through Jesus Christ. Ultimately, it would not be revealed by flesh and blood. It would be revealed that it's by Jesus. And that, that's the context. Again, we have to understand dust, flesh and blood, death, resurrection, and all these details. Again, resurrection, um, the term... Uh, I'm not sure if it's apontesis. There's, a, there's another Greek word that is used for um, resurrection. And what it means is to stand upright. If you picture it, Israel was dead. They were laying flat down. They were not being used for God. Once they would be able to stand upright, they would be able to move correctly and actually make known the manifold wisdom of God. That's the end of the church. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15 tells you that that's why the church was established, to make known the manifold wisdom of God. But we're doing it through the spirit, not relying on flesh and blood. Again, very important to understand these details. So if you understand the resurrection of the dead, you look at 1 Corinthians 15, you look at 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 5, you see the transition very clearly there of the old covenant, the, the fading glory of Moses to the glorious realities of being in Christ, the ministry of reconciliation being preached to the Jews, that they are now being reconciled to God. And that reconciliation was bringing about 
the light to the Gentiles. Again, Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 15. These are all the details that if you read the Apostle Paul's epistles as letters to the church, understanding the audience relevance in the cultural context, the details become very clear. Romans chapter 8 talks about this resurrection as the manifestation of the sons of God. They would now know who are those that are in covenant with their God. Then Philippians chapter 3, again, talks about the difference between the circumcision done with the flesh, circumcision done um, of without hands, you know, and he contrasts two covenants. That's the details. We must understand these details. So what flesh and blood could not do as it was weakened by the law, Christ did by dying in the flesh. Again, that, that's showing you the, the contrast of these two covenants. We must understand carnal, fleshly, natural. That's what's happening. The carnal, fleshly, natural things were against God. They're opposite God. There is a way that seems right to a man, but that way leads to destruction. That is the proverbial advice. The ancients have been people that have made up gods of their own, right? When Israel went into the land, in the land of Canaan, there were idols set up everywhere. Israel was affected by that idolatry and thus declared dead. Today, in Jesus Christ, we are given the proper relationship with God, the true and righteous and faithful understanding of God, and we are called to exult in him. That we know that the resurrection of the dead had occurred. God did resurrect those old covenant saints, that the dead in Christ were raised, and ultimately we have all been transformed into a glorious new covenant. That's the warp and woof of the New Testament, if I'll use a pretty cool phrase. Um, it, it's that we'll live it. It's that we'll live in this one body. And if I may, I'm going to end today's broadcast with a reading from the book of Ephesians to depict the glorious good news that is being made known through full preterism, fulfilled eschatology. If you will, turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. I'm sorry, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And you, dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the prince that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Again, we know John chapter 8 clearly tells you who those sons of disobedience were. It was the, the Jews in that generation that were persecuting the prophets, persecuting the, the um, saints, and you know ultimately they were being very disobedient to the glory of God. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. There you go. Indulging the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and were nature... By nature, children of wrath, even as the rest, again, following those carnal desires, being stuck in the, the lust of the flesh rather than um, glorifying God in spirit and in truth. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up, us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that the ages to come might show the surpasses, so that in ages to come we might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not a result of works, that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Remember formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at a time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace, who made both groups in one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh enmity, which is the law of commandments, an ordain contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together in a dwelling of God in the spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me, given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me a mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace with which was given to me according to the working of his power. 
to me, the very least of all the saints, the grace was given to preach the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery for the ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers through the church, the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you catch that? That's the power. That's the new covenant. That's what we're welcomed into. Nothing about crazy flying in the sky, going to live with Jesus in heaven with a new body. None of that. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that you would put off the flesh, fleshly lusts. Again, it does have to do with the sensual desires and everything else. But really, it had to do with how the Gentiles were boasting in and of themselves and how it led them over to those depravity things. You know, the, the fruits of the, the lust of the flesh that you see in Galatians chapter 5. And then if you would come into the spirit, you would, you know, into this one glorious body of Christ. You would then get to bear the fruits of the spirit. That was the goal from the beginning, that God's people would bear fruit of being in covenant with him, that they would be his wisdom and understanding to the nations around them. And that is how we, the church today, make known the manifold wisdom of God in spirit and in truth and provide the healing of the nations that is so direly needed. Again, that is what full preterism is saying. That is an understanding of this book. This book has nothing to do with all the crazy stuff people are trying to make it out to say. We must understand biblical Christianity. I'm so glad to be a part of the amazing reforms that are happening in the body of Christ. I pray that this video is edifying to you and glorifying to God. And please just join me in prayer as we end our broadcast. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory and praise, Lord. And we just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to go through the scriptures, to talk about some of these details, Lord, and the amazing insights that you have given us through historical reliability. So again, Lord, we just magnify you and praise you. And I pray for the listeners, Lord, that they would be edified, that they would be built up, that they would be humbled by the, the truth of your word, the clarity of your word, Lord. And ultimately, we would, we would all come into a unity of the faith. We give you all the praise in and through Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in. And I look forward to producing more videos as time goes on.